as we've been concentrating on getting ready for the True Crime Awards on the 9th of June and CrimeCon on the 10th and 11th of June, we're taking a wee break from the usual Scottish Murders episodes. In this week's episode, I spoke with Scottish author Denzel Myrick. In the past, Denzel has been a freelance political journalist, a police officer with Strathclyde Police, but he is now a best-selling Scottish author of 10 crime thriller books, which feature Detective Chief Inspector Jim Daly and are set in the fictitious town of Kinloch, which is based on Campbelltown, where Denzel is from. The DCI Daily series is now set to be adapted into a major television series starring Game of Thrones actor Rory McCann. Denzel is also the author of standalone novels, ranging from gangland thriller Terms of Restitution to the fantasy and humour laced A Large Measure of Stone. For those of you who have already read all of Denzel's novels, then you'll be excited to know that the 11th instalment of the DCI Daily series, No Sweet Sorrow, is now available. Welcome to the show, Denzel. Yes, hello Don. thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Well, it's great to have you on. Um, I'm a big fan of crime fiction, and I've recently started reading the DCI Daily series. Um, I've just completed the first book, Whiskey from Small Glasses, and I've yes. started and I've started on the second book, The Last Witness, oh. and it really starts with a bang. It just goes straight in there, and it just grabs you. So I really, I'm really enjoying that the start of that, that one. Great stuff. I also really like the relationship between DCI Daily and DS Brian Scott, and I love Brian's humour. I was laughing out loud in the first book um, <laughs> during a few points. I was, it was, my husband was sleeping. I was reading it at night, and I was laughing out loud. So, so I think yeah, that one's yeah, well. That's I like to hear. So I just wanted to ask you: Is DCI Daily or any other characters based on anyone in particular? No, mostly <clears throat> they come out of my head. I mean, as in. The majority of my characters just come out there. There are hints of people I've known over the years, but it'd be wrong to say that anybody's based in, on anybody in particular. Um, you know, some sometimes Daly has says something that I remember, you know, that I think somebody else might have said, or Brian Scott has a quip that somebody else might have said, I think. Um, but very no, you 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 run the risk of all sorts of problems if you try to base it on, on real people and that's um some some writers have got themselves into huge problems doing that. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's interesting. It just comes from your head. Either one-liners yeah. of Brian. Oh, spot on. <laughs> Even Brian's one-liners, yes. <laughs> really good. <laughs> so we've talked um, I've talked about your first book in the series, Whiskey from Small Glasses, and you've got your 11th book in the series, No Sweet Sorrow. It's just coming out on the that's 1st correct. of June. It's published on the 1st of June, yeah. 1st of June. So can you tell me, without giving too much away, because obviously not everybody's read all the series yet, including myself, tell me about the journey between you, know, you and DCI Daily from the beginning, from the first book, to now, <clears> all, of, yeah. all of you's grown, both of you, the character and you. Well, I mean, I... I uh began writing because I wasn't I was unwell. I was I was I had bad arthritis beginning around, you know, and, and by the time 2010, 2011 came along, it was really, really bad and prevented me from working. So I decided to realise the, the dream that I'd always had and that was to write a book. Mm-hmm. So we did I, I thought of a number of books that I could write and I'd really wanted wanted to write historical fiction. But I decided that to do that justice you have to do a great deal of research. And I didn't want to face the scenario whereby I would be um, have done all this research and then not be able to write a book. Because when you start off in your first novel ever, you've no idea whether you can do that or not. So that was how it began, and it's just gone on from then. And I'd no, I'd no expectation that the the books would be as successful as they are, and it's been very gratifying. And so that's the kind of beginning of the journey, and, and the journey we're still on. We'll talk about where it's going next in a minute. But can you tell me a little bit more about the new book, um, No Sweet Sorrow, without giving too much away? Have you got that? Yes, no, I won't give too much away. I mean, No Sweet Sorrow is probably one of the darkest daily books to date in that it deals with a subject matter that is very realistic but not nice. I mean, it's, we're talking about the rise of the use of fentanyl and these other um, super drugs coming across from America, which are much more readily available than their predecessors, cocaine and and heroin and all the rest of the the drugs that have been about hitherto, uh, and how it's affecting small communities and how it impacts on people's lives. And Daly and Scott are fight are part of the national fight to to stop that. And when a group of young 
at mountain, a mountaineering club from Oxford University arrive in Kinloch to do some training for their next expedition. There the whole thing kicks off and you find out, you know, really what the main thread of the story is. Don't get me wrong, there's the same okay. lighthearted Scotisms and all the rest of it, but I mean, I think it's all centred around a moral dilemma that somebody faces in the books. You know, the the, the centrepiece is this, the fulcrum of it is this moral dilemma. And if they can sort that out, well, fair enough. If they can't, you know, will they go one way or the other? Is it the rule book or your gut feeling? We hear all the time about gut feelings, and certainly one of the characters in your first book, Whiskey from Small Glasses, was questioning whether he had what it took to be a police officer, if he had that instinct, that gut feeling you talked about. As an ex-police officer yourself, is that something you need to inherently have, or is that something that you can learn over time? I can't remember the name of that character. Was it Was it Archie, was it? It was, yes. Yeah, I think, I think the police officers rely a great deal on instinct, and you know, indeed, on their own discretion. It was certainly to the fore when I was in the police a very long time ago. Mm-hmm. I think it's especially prevalent in you know, with young constables or detectives, especially when they they join up at first. And, you know, it's a whole new world and it's something, you come off the street, yes, you're trained, yes, you've all the rest of it. But in essence, you you really have to, to learn on the job. It's, a, it's not a job you can teach particularly well because... As soon as you walk out of the front door of a police office, you never know what support you're going to face or encounter. And that's the, that was what makes it such an interesting job, but also at times can make it such a challenging job and such a, a dangerous job too. You know, I, I think that you have to have a certain amount of humanity must come into the job. They're not robots. And while there are rules and regulations, you have to be cognizant of the fact that that sometimes... Um, extraordinary circumstances demand extraordinary solutions and every police officer on the beat right now or a detective or whatever they do uh, are facing decisions that have to be implemented there and then and it's very difficult for you know for for the man in the street to to maybe get that across but you know there should be humanity in every walk of life and sometimes I think we forget that. Yeah, you do tend to forget that police officers don't know what they're going to encounter when they leave the police station, and that could potentially make it a very dangerous job to do. I, I think in general what's happened in Scotland has been the politicisation of, of policing. Police Scotland only came about as a body because of political will to do do so, and I don't think it's been a particular success, and I think we're seeing how unsuccessful it's been with the the outgoing chief constable's valedictory remarks on leaving the force. Um, I feel that it would never have happened had it not been for the prevailing political climate. And it's been to the detriment of um, the service and indeed made many police officers' lives much more difficult. So I think when when we consider the the transformation of these institutions, I think a great deal more thought should be put into how they're they're developed than, than was before Police Scotland, um, Police Scotland's inception. It's interesting in the book, the book that I've just read, it's before Police Scotland, it's when it was still all separate. Mm. So does that maintain throughout or do you move into when they become Police Scotland or do you stay with them all separate? No, the, the books are written in the present and mm. I thought of the present. I wrote these books before Police Scotland was existed and the books change over to Police Scotland at one point. I can't remember which, which book it is, okay. but they do change over them. Honestly, I can't remember which one it is. The 2016 one, anyway, I think. You've written so probably... many, haven't you? <laughs> they just all well, into is... one now. <laughs> well, this is the 11th daily I've written. I know, I know. It's coming out tomorrow, and I've written a, stand-up, a standalone gangster thriller that was published um, a couple of years ago, and I've also done three novellas, an uh, anthology of short stories, and I'm moving over to Penguin Random House, to Transworld, and I've already written a book called um, Murder at Holly House, which will come out near Christmas. Mm-hmm. And I've just finished a new thriller for them, um, which will be out next summer. So, yeah, I've written a few books. And that was my <laughs> next question. Are you going to write more for the GCI daily series? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll write. My aim has always been to write not just daily, but other things as well. And so that's how we'll progress. I'll, I'll write books and then daily books as well. So by no means is he, is he ending is his uh, job in the beat, but uh, there'll be other other things moving forward too. 
Yeah, a bit of variety. I like a bit of change, and I've noticed some of your other ones, the standalone ones, have got more comedy in them as well, and a bit of fantasy, and I like these kind of things, a bit of a change. Yeah, the wee the wee Sandy Hoynes novellas, it's magical realism, you know, and they were all intended for Christmas, and you know, I wanted them to be nostalgic and a bit a bit magical and a bit different, and they certainly aren't crime novels. I think that it's very easy for people to put writers into little pigeonholes. So if you've written one thing. Um, you you that you've got to stay writing that for the rest of your your life, and I've never thought that's a good idea to be honest, because writers are so versatile and um, crime fiction has been very good to me, I must admit. But it's not I I don't want to stay in the genre all the time forever. Yeah, well, talking <clears> about <throat> you know changing, as we mentioned that um, the DCI Daily series is going to be adapted to a major television series. So how much involvement do you think you'll have in that? Will you be on the set, or are you just handing it over to? them to do with us the please no i'm an executive producer one of three executive producers on the on the show which you know is basically the the kind of showrunners um in charge of the production so but uh, we suffered from majorly from um the, the covid outbreak as so many other people did in terrible ways but what happened was we announced the making of this thing that it was going to happen in november 2021 just before omicron arrived and so that set us back four, five, six months. So we're, we've, we're behind schedule and getting things done, but it's moving along very nicely, and and I hope you'll enjoy it when it eventually appears. Oh, definitely. You must have been really excited to have that opportunity as well. It's not something I ever expected, Dawn. I mean, I think that when you write books, you're a writer. I, I think people tend to think that as a writer, your only ambition is to have your books made into film or television. And I don't think that's true. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, up until two years ago, I had nothing to do with film or television. But it's very nice when they are picked up and something's happen, happening with them. And it's even nicer to be involved at, you know, a very um, close level with, with the production and how it's moving, you know, how it's made, what it's all about, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a great opportunity. And it's, I've certainly learned a lot in the last two years, that's for sure. I bet you have another string to your bow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is it going to be, I suppose, like a Vera one? Is it going to be episodic? You know, you're going to have sort of a series and then you're going to continue doing them or is it going to be a one-off? No, it'll be an episodic series, oh, not necessarily right. the same as Vera, but it'll be a, an episodic um, show um, like so many others. But you probably, um, I think that people will be surprised by the level of production and everything else that's involved in this and, and um, its footprint, as in where it'll be seen. So I think it's going to be, uh, it's very exciting. It's a shame that I can't say more to you about it. I know, it, I know. Can I ask you then, because Rory McCann's playing DCI Daily? He is, so yes. You describe DCI Daily so specifically. Can you see him fitting as DCI Yeah, absolutely. Daily? I mean, I, it all came about in a very strange way because what happened was my some of my readers on Facebook had a vote as to who they would like to play DCI Daily in a potential television series or film. And this is oh, five five years ago, easily. And the name that came out of the hat was, was Rory McCann. No, really? And, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and, and Rory wrote to us to say how, how delighted he was to be involved with the project and how, you know, how he'd love to play the play the part. And as it happened, things moved on from there and, and it ended up that's what's going to happen. So... Yeah, I can absolutely see him in the part. I think he's perfect for it. And I think people get the the description of DCI Daily in the book wrong sometimes because, oh. you know, he's a tall man, mm -hmm. um, DCI Daily. He might be a bit overweight, but he's yeah. not. I, mean, I had one guy, I remember saying to me that he thought Richard Griffiths would be ideal uh, to play the late actor Richard Griffiths. No. And, of course, he played Harry Potter's uncle in the Harry Potter films. And without being unkind to Mr Griffiths, uh, he didn't really fit the profile of... Of no. daily, no, I think um, that's not who I see him as at all. <laughs> no, I think I think what was it? What was what did I say at one point in the beginning of Whiskey from Small Glasses? Tall, dark, handsome, and a bit overweight. A bit overweight, aye, but you don't. It's not like he's you know plodding along. It's just like he's you know he's looking in the mirror and he's it's just hanging over his a wee bit. <laughs> it's yeah, bursting I mean, I out think, a wee bit. <laughs> I think it's that lots of people when they reach middle age suddenly find that they can't eat and drink the way they did when they were young. <laughs> and, you know, these things creep up on you. And I think that's 
what he was facing there then because <laughs> it, you know that's that's how it goes. But uh, no, I think I think Rory's bang on ideal for the for the role. Yeah. yeah. And oh, I'd probably not be able to answer this either, but obviously it's set in the fictional Kinloch, which is mm. Campbelltown. Is it going to be set in a Scottish, you know, will it be filmed in a Scottish town in Campbelltown or do, do you know? The uh, exterior shots will be filmed in, in Kintyre, yeah. Is it? Oh, that's brilliant. So it'll be authentic. Well, you couldn't really do it anywhere else. And no. I, don't think anybody, I don't think anybody really wanted to do that, to be honest, not from the start, because... You know, the, the setting is such a big part of the books, mm-hmm. and you know, um, if you know there was any attempt to change that to somewhere else or America or wherever, yeah. and it just wouldn't be the same. And so, I never, I most certainly didn't want to do that. And to be fair, nobody involved with the project has ever suggested that. Good, because you do. You describe the, you know, the harbour, the two harbours, and how the the meet, and you know. You know, look. I had to look at the photos afterwards. Apparently, I've been there when I was a child because my <laughs> grand used to do the phone boxes all round our gale. Oh, but, right, yeah. um, um, I don't remember, but um, yes, I looked it up <clears> and I was like, "God, you've just you described it. It's perfect. <laughs> the way the meat and you know the ones at that side, and uh, yeah, it's really good." Yeah, I mean, I I stick pretty close to, you know, the topography of Campbelltown when I'm writing the books, but not always. Right. You know, I do depart because it's a fictitious town based in yeah. heavily in Campbelltown, yeah, but mm-hmm. it's not Campbelltown. And so I'm free to add a building here or there or a road there here or there or something in the in the countryside that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um so it's not always I mean people go down there quite a lot. I mean so many of the daily readers have gone to Kintyre to, to see where the the books are set and they come and say, Oh, where's such and such and where's such and well it, that's out of my head. It's not <laughs> it didn't really you know, um, but that's, I like to, I think Campbelltown's ideal setting because it's a little bit of urban Scotland in the middle of the countryside. And, and I think it's a great place to do, as I did right from the beginning, I always thought that, that Kintar would be a fabulous setting for the books. And so it's proved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it has. It's it's lovely. I'm really enjoying it. Um, I don't know how I've not come across you because I devour crime fiction. I really enjoy crime fiction. I don't, maybe I've come across you, but. You know, you kind of tend to stick to the ones you know. I understand that, yeah. I mean, like for you, Ken and Balmadera, Quentin Jarden have been going for all these years. It's a great strength in Scottish crime writing, and uh, it's well worth investing your time having a look at other people. I mean, it, it's a horses for courses thing, isn't it? You know, you're one man's meat's another one's poison, so you may read somebody, somebody else may, might read the deal and they don't like it, or you might read somebody else and you don't like them. Um, but all in all, it's it's good to spread the word and it's good to, you know, with so many great writers on on the shelves and, and available, it's good to make people aware of them. Definitely. Well, I like the Scottish books because, and especially you, you talk in, you, you know, D, uh, DS, Brian Scott, he talk, you make him talk Glaswegian. It's, I, I love that. See, <laughs> I like the Glaswegian accent, so I can hear it in my head because you do it, you know, you, as, you write it as he would speak. My, my intention always was to have if I had, the first idea I had about the daily books was to have two Glasgow detectives in a rural setting where they didn't have all the resources that they have available to them in the city at the, the click of a finger, and they had to adapt to that. And and as far as the accents go, I always wanted it to be authentic in a way that it was understandable to everybody, mm-hmm. but, but um, also readers who know Glasgow, who know the accent in Kintyre, could create that that in their mind and, and allow them to, to, you know, to make more of the book. I mean, I've had a very, very few problems with people who, I've had one reviewer once that wrote, um, I didn't realise the books were written in Scotch. <laughs> no, that's the worst thing you can say. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, clearly this guy had no idea whatsoever, but <laughs> I don't think the the, the odd "och" or little saying here and there is going to make it unintelligible to no. the, the the English speaking world, and and you know I find these a bit tedious people like that. But what can you do? No, nothing. You just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> the only That's thing it. when you said about the Kintyre accent, um, I was saying to my because my gran loves crime, um fiction as well so we pass it backwards and forwards so she's read you i've said okay oh, you know get reading this one and you'll like this so she's read it so we're debating it backwards and forwards what we were thinking and it was the hmm. entire accent yet when you say they say hoot 
I didn't know that. I was saying to her, hoot, did they, yeah. say, they say hoot? Say it in they a sentence to me. <laughs> they actually say hoot in Campbell. She but said I made that. It, she said that. And I was like, no, but it says hoot. <laughs> well, I, well I, made it, I made it hoot to make it right. more obvious what was going on to readers that don't know the, <laughs> which is most people in the world. And, she said that. And, yeah, so I made it hoot instead of hoot because, you know, somebody, you know, Hoot's more recognisable as what than yeah, than yeah. Hoot. Uh, <laughs> but they do say Hoot. Your, your grandma is absolutely right. Yeah, um, I was like, no, that's not what he's written. <laughs> no, yeah, she, you know, you have to, you, you have to, uh, you know, consider the fact that again, most people that read these books aren't from Kintyre or haven't been to Kintyre. Yeah. And you know, you've got to make it readable for them as well. So you have to take we meanders down the linguistic or <laughs> um, now and again just to just to get your point across well i'm thoroughly enjoying them i can't wait to read more i'm like i say i've just started the second one i'm like oh, it's like a page turner already <laughs> i'm delighted you, you you're enjoying them that's really mm -hmm. good done thank yeah, you absolutely i've got my gran on them as well so we'll be devouring them together <laughs> Well, good. No doubt, I've stood in a phone box where your gran used to work hard. Hi. Um, so <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Me in um, the car playing my tapes while she's busy cleaning. <laughs> God love her. That was a, yeah. that was a hard job. She loved it. Do you know that because it was like out in the countryside. She's a country person, and she just sure. loved it. Travelling all over that Argyle, she just loved it. Oh yeah, it must have been really nice. I mean, Campbelltown's a long way from just about everywhere, but it's a lovely drive and. I'm delighted to say that more people are, are going down and I hope they manage to short, sort the ferries out so, you know, that, that even more people can get there because um, the ferry, I believe, has been cancelled since, it's, oh, since its beginning. Yeah, it happens every year because there are ferry, ferry problems elsewhere and they take the Campbellton ferry off to substitute for ferries in other places mm -hmm. um, because it's only a seasonal service. But it's the old thing that only islands need ferries and that's not true mm -hmm. because even though... Kintyre is the, the mainland, you know, it's a hell of a drive to get anywhere at all. It's a long and way around. It's a long way around. So a ferry brings a whole new, you know, people to Campbelltown, people to Kauai or Kintyre who would never have come otherwise because they wouldn't fancy the drive. Yeah. And it's sad to see that, that it's no, it's not on again, um, which is, must be very annoying for those that have booked up and also for those who are in the town and looking to, in the shops and pubs and restaurants trying to do business, you know. Of course, yeah. And there's the Mull of Kintyre Music Festival. I'm uh, going to be mentioning that in my other podcast. Um, mm. But I hope it's back on for that. Well, I mean, they, I think they make an effort to get it back on for the Mull of Kintyre uh, Music mm. Festival. But I think, the, I, I'm, I can't remember when the Fisk Whiskey Festival was, but I think it may have been impacted by the the absence of the ferry. I'm not sure. That's Don't take sure. my word for that. But mm. it won't be the first time that things have been impacted by by the lack of a ferry. Mm. And it's a great, it's a great pity because, and it tends to be a very short notice as well. So if you come in the ferry, the only the last resort, there's no train to Campbellton, yep. so you're on the bus or on the plane, mm -hmm. and the plane's quite expensive, and the buses are, you know, a long a long road, it's mm -hmm. four four and a half five hours to come to Glasgow on the bus from from Campbelltown. So it's quite a journey, um, and the ferry makes it all so much more accessible and. Or touristy and everything else yeah, you can imagine. It's just lovely going on a ferry. I miss it up in Sky because we always okay. used the ferry. Ah, I miss it. Going over the bridge is not the same. <laughs> no, it's not the same. I, I used to have been to Sky a few times and, and the last time was over the bridge and I, it just didn't give you the same no. feeling, does it? I think people forget. I mean, it's, as I'm saying about Kintyre, I think people forget that people have to live in Kintyre and people do live it, but they've got to have their lives. And so getting to airports, getting to the city, has to be easier, and I suppose it's like that for people on Sky. Now they have the bridge; they can hop off any time they want. Mm -hmm. But but it's a shame to lose that great tradition of going on a ferry to get somewhere. Well, Denzel, it's been lovely chatting with you. Thank you very much for having me in the podcast. That's really nice of you, um, and I hope that people will enjoy No Sweet Sorrow, which comes out tomorrow, first of June. First of June, whenever you buy your your books. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, you know, it's always, there's also a tad of trepidation when you publish a new book, even after all these previous titles. Mm -hmm. But uh, all in all, I think the response to Daily has been pretty, pretty good um, so far. We've had great reviews from, from both readers and the press, and it's great to be able to, to offer that. Yeah, absolutely. 
And if anybody would like to find out more about you and all of your books, they can go to your website. Yes, denzelmyatt.com, or they can go to my various Twitter feeds, that Loch Lomond Den on Twitter, or Denzel Myatt author on Facebook, etc., etc. I think they're all in the books. Yep. So, yeah, feel free to visit them and, and uh, join the party. Yes, and as a quote, there was a review by the Times, um, mm. so to everybody that hasn't read your books yet, if you haven't read Myrick, now is the time. I've had a few quotes from the Times. That was a nice one as well. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, I've had quotes from the, the likes of the Wall Street Journal and the Daily Mail and all, all the big newspapers, and it's always nice when you get that because it, it helps to bring the books to a wider audience, and that's, that's always nice. So that was my wee chat with author Denzel Myrick. Like Denzel said, you can find more about all of Denzel's books, including his new book, No Sweet Sorrow, which is out now, as well as more about Denzel, from his website, denzelmyrick.com, as well as follow Denzel on Twitter, at Lochlomander, and on facebook.com slash author. All links will be in the show notes. I'm going to leave you today with a promo for our new podcast, Scottish Digest. Episodes 1 and 2 are out now, and Denzel will feature in a future episode when we cover Campbelltown. You can listen wherever you get your podcasts or watch on YouTube. Each week on Scottish Digest, we'll tell you about a different place to visit in Scotland. We'll also tell you what you can do and see while you're there. We'll give you personal recommendations of places to eat and stay. And we'll even tell you about events and festivals that will be taking place. So join us on each episode for a wee slice of Bonnie Scotland.